I have the great pleasure of introducing to you. Uh, I said to him, uh, Colonel Turkson, what do I call you? Thinking he would say his eminence or something. He said, how about Peter? I, I won't use Peter. <laughs> um, I, I will use Cardinal Turkson. Uh, but he is at the forefront of terms of the ideas that we have been discussing here this morning in the few minutes that we have gotten started as we have laid out uh, the imperative of this conference. Um, uh, he has some familiarity with the United States, having been to school there. Um, he went back to Ghana, became an archbishop, and then a cardinal, first uh, nominated by uh, Pope John Paul II, then Pope uh, Benedict brought him here uh, to the Vatican, and then Pope Francis has given him this new responsibility. Uh, here is what Pope Francis said to him when he handed over this responsibility, which begins in January 2017. The dicastery will be competent, particularly in issues regarding migrants, those in need, the sick, the excluded and the marginalized, the imprisoned and the unemployed, as well as victims of armed conflict, natural disasters, and all forms of slavery and torture. You, sir, have your hands full. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's, uh, that's quite the case. And I suppose very many of you in, in the first place, you know, good morning to all of you and very glad to be in your midst this morning to, to share these thoughts of Pope Francis with you. Now, uh, you certainly know governments. If governments had to deal with this, they would have, I don't know how many ministries they would have, you know, uh, to deal with these issues. And it's all because Pope Francis, as part of his reform, he decided to bring these, you know, the different offices. There used to be an office that dealt with migrants. There used to be an office that dealt with humanitarian assistance. And then an office that dealt with uh, health care and uh, you know, sanitation. But I suppose to bring them all together and to fashion for them a very good arrowhead for penetration and for effectiveness, he's decided to bring them all together on the one head. All right, so, go ahead. No, so that's, that's, that's what we're preparing for. And, and right from the beginning, we decided this should not be a conglomerate of offices. We decided to, to formulate a new vision of Pope Francis for the church's involvement in the social arena. So we, in the process of formulating this, and when we're done formulating, we see what offices and structures we will need to enable us to you know, carry out this vision of Pope Francis. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, you had a lot to do with the Pope's encyclical on the environment. Uh, some consider you the primary architect of that, connecting what happened to the environment and poverty. But it, I want to pick up again on this theme. Tell me what you think of business. What do you think of business? And what you think might come out of this conference in terms of what business can do and what the church can do in a very concrete way in mm. attacking questions of poverty and inequality. Thanks. And uh, <laughs> concretely now, uh, I, I, I came to the Vatican in 2010. This was the midst of the financial crisis. And so we thought that it was our responsibility to provide a way of looking at this financial situation, and part of it was business, of course, banking and all of that. So one of the first things we did was to help and encourage the church to stop pointing accusing fingers at the world of business. So we produced a small booklet, which we called the vocation of the business leader. And with that, invited business leaders to consider what they do in terms of a vocation. Now, vocation for us then is not limited to when people want to become priests or become you know, brothers or nuns or whatever, but it's an invitation to business to recognize themselves in their transformative role of the resources available as co-creators, as partners with God, you know, making the resources of nature serve the good of humanity. And so sometimes we put that concrete by saying God created a tree, God did not create furniture. It required business to transform trees into furniture, to transform minerals into whatever objects we use. So essentially that's what we think a business is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a partner with God in bringing the resources of nature to the concrete use of humanity. And therefore, concrete, what a business can do? I think business therefore serves not only those who enable business people to work, so the investors, 
but also those who need to benefit from business, and so there's a very many different stakeholders. So that's what basically we encourage business to do, and sometimes, you know, we have to tell, uh, we have to encourage business people to recognize basically three things. To ensure that work itself is dignified, to ensure that wealth which they make is also good wealth, and to ensure that the customer relationship is also good. And we think when this is observed, then basically business fulfills a very dignified you know, role in society. How does business balance its responsibility to its stockholders uh, with its responsibility to stakeholders being humanity? No, stakeholders enable business people to do what they do. They invest in bringing money to enable business CEOs to do business. But they, re, the character of business depends on more than those who bring in the money. If, it's, if we're dealing with a mining you know, company, for example, there is the place you go to, there, is, there are the people who live on the terrain, there are people whose lives will be transformed by the mining activity and who may be moved to one side or the other. So in, in, you know, involved in this is just more than the, you know, the uh, you know, investors, but also, you know, so we encourage, we encourage a more, if you want, a holistic view you know, of business and its activity. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, bottom line for us is that everything that happens should serve the well-being of the human person. And what we say, therefore, is that the human person is the only thing that God created for its own sake. Everything else was created for the well-being and to serve the human person. The human person is the one who was created not to serve anything else, but for its own sake, as it were. And when, therefore, the exercise of business or any other human activity or engagement tends to make man serve another goal or aim, we think that you know, it's suffering a little bit of distortion. And we'd want to then remind that, you know, everything should serve the well-being of the human person, and the human person may not be reduced into becoming any object that serves any other concern. Do you believe that, or does the church believe that there is the necessary uh, regulation, and, and here's what the Pope said, for example. <laughs> the Pope said, it is not so much the market economy itself, but the ideology that too often lies behind it the deified market, or the magical conception of the market, which resists the necessary political oversight and regulation. Mm. What did the Holy Father mean? <laughs> what he meant, I think, he, you meet him tomorrow, he'll probably tell you what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think what, what, what you know, we, there's something from this we can pick up. What I referred to as when I got here, in the midst of finance, we produce a small booklet. We called it Reforming the Financial System, and then went on to say in the light of a global you know, authority, global financial right, authority. Right. The booklet was well received in several places, and it brought us at one, you know, at one point to Frankfurt, to the Bundesbank, to, to, you know, to discuss this with business people, investors, bank leaders, and all of that. Everything, the analysis we made of the crisis well, you know, was accepted, acceptable and all. We identify moral causes of the, we identify, identify technical or technological causes. But when it came to establishing global authority to, over, to exercise some oversight of finance, there we had the greatest resistance. Mm. So the, the establishment of any form of authority to, you know, to regulate this is not, it's not easy. And probably that's what, the, what, that's what the Pope is referring to. At a certain point, the only way that we can ensure and guarantee that, you know, you know, you know it all so well, you know, uh, every now and then comes up, LIBOR, LIBOR or LIBOR right, in England. LIBOR, right. Yeah, it needs to, needs to be fixed, and then there's a problem about who controls the rates and all of that. A certain amount of, a certain amount of control is necessary to ensure the ethical form of all of these. And I think that's what the Pope is referring to. In, in America, they call it Dodd-Frank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea of the dignity of work. Yeah. I mean, you have asked us to consider, the world to consider, um, the dignity of work mm. and whether we ought to be about having machines perform the work of human beings. Mm. This, 
this, I think, is going to be a program that would engage our you know, creativity and attention for you know, quite a bit of time. Uh, since the days of Pope John Paul II, we've been invited to not to reduce work to just its objective creation or production of things. We've been invited to recognize what work also does to the human person. And so we've been invited to recognize the objective and the subjective character of work. Not reduced to what we produce, but what also work does to the, the worker or the human person. It ensures its uh, dignity, not because he earns a salary and in the terms of Pope Francis can put bread on the table of the family, but work also helps you know, uh, create a human person in the sense that it can provide an opportunity for one to exercise his own creativity, put to work his own talents, and his God endowed you know, rich, rich, riches. So work, therefore, is not, the sense of work is not to be limited to what we produce, but recognize that work does also improve the subjective nature, character of the one who exercises work. The dignity then of the human person is made manifest also in what he produces or what he does. That's probably is also the only way that any human person created in the image and likeness of God resembles God in producing things out of his own creativity, talents, and endowments. And that's why we would like to invite people to also For his uh, own sense of dignity and for the dignity Definitely. of his family. Yeah. Right. Uh, Michael Gerson, writing in the Washington Post, he's a columnist for the Washington Post, said, mm -hmm. talking about globalization and, and, and the rise of populism and all of that, said, the Davos set and globalized elites are leading participants in an economic system with its global supply chain, freely moving capital, and rapid innovation that during the past 20 years has taken a billion people, a billion people out of extreme poverty around the world. This is arguably the greatest humanitarian achievement in history, without debating the greatest. Um, <laughs> that's a remarkable achievement. Certainly. Uh, and so the point here, and I keep coming back to it, is what's necessary to make sure that government, NGOs, business, with all the resources, with all the opportunities, with all the human capital uh, that businesses have, the best and brightest in many cases, um, how do you employ it along lines of morality and profit? Uh, the statement you just quoted of you know, business and you know, or having lifted right. a lot of right. people out right. of poverty goes on to say, I don't know if we quote it from the same source, goes on to while it has lifted so very many out of poverty, it has also increased inequality. Exactly right, it does. Okay? Yes. So it's lifted a lot out of poverty, but also inequality in certain cases have also been increased. And for us, it will be great if it will, you know, lifting people out of poverty doesn't increase inequality in any way. So uh, exactly what does it require? I think it is, it is to be commended that business, you know, uh, and trade and commerce and all of that help spread, okay, wealth in a, in a, in a very uh, decent way. It does give opportunity for occasion for people to exercise their own creative talents, to exercise work and all. But it will, be, it will be great if, in the process, of course, we're able to also so, you know, uh, make the spread of business and the spread of you know, uh, avenues of work and all of that help us also reduce the inequalities that ensue you know, from, from, from this. So that, you know, I don't know how many, uh, from, I, I, probably let me not uh, go into countries and you know, uh, cite examples, but in certain cases, yes, it's introduced a lot of wealth, right, but it's right. also widened the gap between the rich and the poor. And that, that, that's what, so why we praise. And so the question is, could it have reduced, uh, uh, could it have lifted so many people out of poverty without, without increasing the, in the gap of inequality? That is could it have done that, and, and what is the pathway to do that? <laughs> And what, the can, the, and what the, can the church contribute? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think the, part, the, the part way to do this is, as you observe, not to make profit the main objective of business investment and all our activities, but to make, establish or to recognize as a main goal of business 
the ultimate lifting of people out of poverty, as you say, or the well-being of human person. I know that business requires investment, but profit making and all of that may not become the uh, objective. And as for what the church can do, I think the church can serve as a very decent outlet for promoting and lifting people out of poverty by way of directing resources and investment to the needy areas where this needs to be uh, exercised. And we have a case before us now. We now target and looking at Haiti, Central African Republic, and South Sudan. These are places which are battling with poverty, and we think that we need to, we need to adopt a model that enables them to definitively and concretely emerge out of poverty. So, like, you know, uh, next year, well, one of our concerns would be not to see probably to, disc to try to see the, the pattern which is, you know, which, which is failed and adopt new ones. I think we can, we have the means to change the orbit in which people live and do that in the case through, through basic treatments, housing, work, and uh, access to work. Housing, no, access to work is the same. So housing, work, and if you want, what we call land, okay? Access to, access to property, access to uh, you know, capital that this can, can exploit and use. When we have paradigms that ensure each one having a roof over their head, having works that they can do, way of kind of sustaining their lives and maintaining and sustaining their family, and ultimately something that they can call their own, personal capital, we would probably gradually be succeeding in transforming the orbits in which people live. Is the final argument and the call to action, as a colleague of mine at CBS used to say, uh, you can do good and you can do well at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we wish we can do well. <laughs> not, simply, not simply limit ourselves to good. You know, I think, I think there's a lot of goodwill out there. Yes. Since Pope Francis, uh, since the beginning of uh, the pontificate of Pope Francis, started already at the end of Pope Benedict, but there's been a lot, a lot of show and display of goodwill to respond to the call uh, to action, if you want, by, by Pope Francis. Right. We receive guests from fast food chain who have come to our office and said, we've heard what the Pope is saying, what can we do? And in that case, we say, fine, begin by looking at your supply chain. Yes. and try to improve our tests in supply chain. If you were able to do that, you'd already have helped so very many people. Then others come and say, we you recognize that access to energy is a problem in some, a lot of developing countries. And so they want to help with the pro production a very big scale of, of solar systems so that people don't struggle with you know, smoke and lanterns, kerosene lanterns and stuff like that. That's something that we welcome. And if it may, you know, uh, just a little bit of information. On account of this, we, the Vatican accepted to participate in the, uh, in the you know, Expo 2017 in Astana, Kazakhstan. The, the, you know, the, 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 the theme of that is, you know, future energy, new forms of energy for the future. And the Vatican accepted to participate. Suddenly we go in there, not because we can display new technologies, you know, about energy, but we're going there to try to tell a story about you know, energy that serves the well-being of humanity. And that's why, that's why we're going there. Energy at the beginning of human life, energy in the hands of, human, of humanity, ambiguous, is God good, is God bad? And then emphasize their positive sides towards lifting people out of poverty and conclude with something that normally is not considered, that's energy, in, within all of us, Thank you. and we identify that as spiritual energy that leads us to pray, to meditate, to do you know, all the good things. Cardinal Turkson, thank you so much for coming. Thanks to you all. Okay, thank, thank you. you.